Namaste, everyone. Namaste. Namaste. Hello. How is everyone doing, Chris, Mike? Fantastic. Hot, hottest day of the year so far. <laughs> so, uh, technical difficulties come with that as well. <laughs> Chris, Chris, if we had a penny for every time Chris has mentioned a Northern Ireland weather, I think we would all be very, oh very rich in this <laughs> podcast. It's, um, it's either it's the extremes here in Northern Ireland. It keeps it keeps the uh, environment rugged and beautiful, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> We're exceptionally, exceptionally pleased and uh, proud to, to host and interview Francis, Professor Francis Clooney today from um, Harvard University. Francis, say, say hello. Hello, good to be with you. I'm in Cambridge at the moment, Cambridge in Massachusetts, and it's cool and possibly going to rain this afternoon. So it's an <laughs> interesting weather pattern we're having also. Which is different from Cambridge in the United Kingdom for all those uh, other listeners. Right. What's the link between Cambridge and Cambridge, Professor Clooney? Do you know? When other, the, other um, than that, they host the, two of the best universities in the world, perhaps. Yeah, I think when the original settlers came over on the Mayflower and so on and began to establish, they took names that they were familiar with from back in England and 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 ambitioning to have Harvard as a a, a good college and then later a university, Cambridge seemed to be a good name for that. I, I'm not sure why they didn't use Oxford, but using Cambridge seemed to be acceptable <laughs> to all. That's your subject, yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, so let me just introduce Professor Clooney. Um, he is a Parkman professor at the Divinity, at Divini of Divinity at Harvard University. His primary areas of scholarship are theological commentarial writings in Sanskrit and Tamil traditions of Hindu India and is a leader in the developing field of comparative theology. Is that is that you in a nutshell, Professor Clooney? I think that covers it. Um, both my um, you know, own Christian background, my Catholic background, my long uh, going on 50 years now engagement with Hinduism, study of India, Nepal and so on and then trying to bring them together. So the comparative is about the interface and encounter between the two. Tell us how it started. So why is that? Is it, like I'm imagining you even as a student were interested in this field to make it your lifelong uh, interest. No, it, it started on a, um, you might say almost an accidental basis. Uh, some might say a providential basis. So I entered the seminary uh, to become a a priest and a, a member of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, in 1968, right after secondary school. And in 71, 72, I had to decide where I would uh, get some teaching experience, which was part of our training to parish work or teaching, whatever. And I decided as a young man living in New York City that it would be good to go somewhere else in the world, outside the US, and to expand my horizons learn from another culture. I thought of South America, the Philippines, parts of Africa, and decided that I had this kind of tug toward India, uh, South Asia, in part you know, reading the Bhagavad Gita, um, but also being inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, knowing about Mother Teresa and so on like that. So to make a long story short, I ended up in 73 going to Kathmandu. Uh, where the Jesuit order has still has a very fine school, St. Xavier's School, uh, boarding school set up 25 years before, 1950 or so, at the invitation of the King of Nepal to have a good English language school in Kathmandu. So I was there for two years. I taught in the school. All the boys I taught in this boarding school were Hindu and Buddhist. Uh, I got to learn from them. We went to temples and stupas. Uh, Shivaratri pilgrimages in the night and so on like that. And I just found it fascinating. Um, growing up in New York, certainly in the 70s and 60s, not a lot of evident presence of Hindu culture or life in New York City. But I, I, I latched onto it. it. It made sense to me. And I decided that I wanted this to be part of my life in the years to come. So after I came back um, in 75 to do theological study, I was able then, you know, serious as a, because I wanted to be a scholar, I think, to end up doing doctoral studies at University of Chicago in the South Asia department. So learning Sanskrit, some Tamil, 
uh, going back to India, Chennai, Madras, Mylapur, and so on like that. It just became part of my life and all these, you know, now going on 50 years has been part of my life um, as a Christian, as a Catholic, but the Hindu reality, the Hindu wisdom is really part of who I am at this point. And you can certainly see that both in your um, appearance in Awake, the film, and also in your lovely, beautiful backdrop for all our YouTube listeners, you can see that, but it's the same drap backdrop that was in the film. Um, Professor Clooney has got various fantastic looking ornaments and paintings and books as far as I, the eye can uh, see. It yeah, goes even beyond the... Uh... <laughs> You'd so have to I... see the other side of the office to see more books on the other oh, side. So you can only see one side of them. Yeah. I suppose that's in keeping with your uh, profession, I imagine. Oh, yes. Um, tell us, your, how did you come to be involved with the Awake Film Project? Well, I mean, for me, it, it started, um, you know, a number of years before the Awake Project. And the reason why they contacted me when they were making the film and I was happy to be contacted and interviewed, was that I was very interested in, you know, there's a long, long Christian interest in India, often through missionaries and then colonial powers, the British and so on going to India. But it's harder to find good examples of, of South Asians, uh, Indians, Hindus, who have a sustained deep interest in Christianity or in the Bible. Um, many, many Indians know something about Jesus Christ, know something of the gospel stories. So it's, it's part of, you know, it's a, it's a global reality. And, and given the British and all that, it's not foreign to the Indian culture to know about something about Christianity and the very old churches in Kerala that go back um, possibly as long as 2000 years, uh, the Martoma churches and so on. <clears throat> but in terms of uh, going any deeper than a nod in the direction of Christianity or deep personal respect for Jesus, it's rare. Um, and I, I was fascinated. I think I was, I was out in Los Angeles to do some teaching and somebody brought me over to the Yogananda Center there. I forget what exactly it's called, near the ocean. Um, Lake Shrine perhaps? Maybe, I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, and they um, showed me in their bookstore, the book that had just come out, The Second Coming of Christ the big fat two volumes, <laughs> which I was not aware of until that point, uh, that um, Paramahamsa Yogananda had uh, in a sustained way in his magazine over a number of years, very systematically gone through the gospels and, and written his own commentary. I have it here on the floor next to me in case we need to refer to it. But I, I found that fascinating. And while I knew, of course, as any American would of my ilk and generation, um, autobiography of a yogi and so on. It, it didn't jump out at me as that he would be of special interest to me until I saw these volumes. And the fact that I don't think there's any parallel, certainly in that time period, and maybe even after, of somebody of a Hindu background with his own spiritual tradition, taking um, the Bible so seriously, so seriously as to actually read it and study it, um, rather than just saying it's a wonderful book. Yes, um, going back to your um, your point about uh, India, Christianity in India, and uh, and the West, I suppose. I I was born in personally. I was born in India, and I I, I moved to um, England when I was quite young, and I, I went to a Catholic school here, and you know, with with Indian, our culture is such that you know, you can you can go into a a, a, a church and pray, and next day go into a a uh, temple and pray equally to the other, another deity that you may see because there's so many gods and goddesses mm -hmm. in India and and personally I saw Christ as just another uh, another god and I remember going to school and singing about you know all his glorious hymns and various things and I didn't even consider it uh, anything unique that I was doing like as a Hindu singing about Christ until I grew up and I think you know everyone was like oh, why, why even my own Hindu um, you know family uh, that 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 didn't live with me. They were like, "Oh, why? You know, why are you putting Christ on the altar? Is the, that's not your religion." I was like, "Really?" And then this was this was even before I met. Uh, you know, I was introduced to Yogananda's writing. And mm. I was like, yeah, "But it's just it just feels so natural." You know, it's Christ. Look at look at his life. Look at his work. He's just you know, divinity is a, is a glory. You know, it's in every fiber of his being. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Chris. Chris um, was 
you were raised Catholic, weren't you, Chris? Protestant, yeah, yeah. yeah touch oh, yourself, gosh, yeah. Sorry, we don't sorry. talk about this. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I have the absolute blessing, I, I would say, to have a father who was brought up Protestant and uh, a mother, uh, uh, very, uh, she practices um, Catholic religion quite significantly. So um, I was brought up Protestant, but um, I verged away from that path. My mom thought I was going to be a Catholic, but I wanted to forge my own little path and eventually, you know, 20 some years later, maybe found Yogananda. And, um, but uh, yeah, it, it was really interesting seeing your work, uh, Professor Quinney, you know, on the uh, comparative uh, theology work that, that, that you do, because I grew up in that world of Northern Ireland where, you know, all people did was compare and, and maybe you, you might be able to share more of a definition of what um, what, what it is exactly that you do. Um, uh, because I think uh, I googled it uh, earlier on and your face popped up so it's something that you maybe are at the cornerstone of so so you could maybe highlight a little bit about that. Well uh, thank you uh, Chris and um, I have a very good friend um, a Hindu from Northern Ireland um, you may have heard of him Shonika Rishi Das who is the head of the Oxford Hindu Centre so at Oxford University there is a centre and he from Northern Ireland grew up Catholic and um, was a member of ISKCON, the Hare Krishna movement, and a very dedicated scholar and um, organizer of, of the study of Hinduism at Oxford University. But he was always telling me about growing up in Northern Ireland as part of his life experience and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say a couple of things about you know, uh, what I call comparative theology. The first thing might be uh, what you were indicating, and I think Priyank was indicating, we we can we can do theology, namely faith seeking understanding, which is a standard Catholic understanding of the term. You have faith, you want to understand your faith, and you're on this ongoing process of seeking. You don't just do it and then be done with it, but it's an ongoing life practice of seeking. You do it in terms of your life story. So where are you coming from? What is your background? Uh, what is it you bring to any questions you have? Where does your faith come from, your parents' faith, and so on like that? And I, I think the autobiographical element is, is so important as a starting point because we can't today, whether we're talking Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or Muslim or Jewish or any tradition, put it all in one form and say it has to be this because only this is true. But there has to be a, a telling of personal stories in order to understand but given that general point about autobiography, I think the second thing is that, as I said, uh, comparative theology is a form of theology. And in my Catholic tradition, it is this ancient medieval notion of faith in relation to understanding as a search, a questioning, um, asking, opening to new ideas, both in terms of what the mind can comprehend and also the mystery of God, which is even obviously beyond our minds, but the idea that there is a constant inquiry. And for most people who use the word theology, and most people who use the word theology would be of a Christian background, uh, there would be a sense of inquiring about the meaning of one's faith in the Christian context. And so what does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean? Uh, how can we understand the mysteries more deeply? And then the great teachers of the Catholic Church uh, or Christian churches ranging from St. Paul to St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, um, in Protestant traditions, John Calvin, Martin Luther, all the way up to 20th century figures, men and women who search out the faith. But it seemed to me um, that that would be too narrow an understanding of theology to say, first of all, that only Christians do it. Uh, because I think any tradition where human beings are involved there is going to be experience, commitment, faith, and also the mind, uh, the intellect, the asking of questions. And to recognize that there can be, I think, it's not always accepted by every scholar, Hindu theology, Buddhist theology, Muslim theology, Jewish theology, and so on. Not in the sense of squeezing it into a Christian box, but saying faith seeking understanding. What I, I think I found early on by going to Kathmandu in 1973 and then my studies afterwards and so on is that the questioning that comes to the fore isn't neatly kept within the boundaries of one's own faith tradition 
So one begins in one's own faith tradition, one has to inquire into it. If you don't think about it and ask questions, eventually you'll grow up and you'll lose it because you can't live with the faith of a five-year-old or something like that. But with the questions in the world in which we live, I mean, even now more so than 50 years ago, um, we're surrounded all the time by people of other faith traditions, uh, people who practice and believe and celebrate their faith in different ways. And the idea that the human mind would not be curious about learning from those other faith traditions is really incredible so that we, we do want to know and learn. And I think what I learned in Kathmandu as a young seminarian was that I need not be afraid of that process of learning from other religious traditions, but rather opening myself to them, uh, reading the Bhagavad Gita, reading Ramayana, uh, Mahabharata, uh, going to temples, uh, watching the students engaged in, in puja in the different temples and so on. All of this uh, resonated with my own faith. It echoed my own faith. It was different, but nonetheless seemed to me like an opening to a larger reality rather than a threat that would tempt me to lose my own faith or, or relativize all religions or something. So comparative theology is the more academic version of that, that we have grounding in our own tradition. Um, you know, For people of my age, it's often in a tradition, you, you're born into a tradition, you stay in the tradition. For many younger people today, um, movement over a lifetime. You come from this background, you try this, you try that, you find your way. And many of the students I teach at Harvard are always on their personal search. But if you have a tradition and are part of it, then comparative theology is allowing the questions and wisdom and resources of other religious traditions to filter into your own. Um, you don't, it's not a competition, let's compare them to see which one is true and which one is better. But you learn from them, you bring them in, you see similarities, you see differences, you see things you can accept, you see things you can't accept, and it becomes this ongoing practice. I, uh, my personal pro, you know, um, proclivity is toward Hindu traditions, but there's no reason why uh, a, a Christian or a Catholic couldn't engage with Buddhist traditions or Islam or Judaism in the same way. And likewise, everybody has their own you know, way of learning. Some people have brilliant minds and they can learn from like seven different religious <laughs> traditions at once. I'm more of a focused person and think at least in this lifetime, two traditions is probably enough for me. <laughs> Although I respect other traditions, it's more the Hindu that I, I uh, you know, come to. And so comparative theology is about not comparative religion, not the history of religions, not sociology of religion, but faith seeking understanding across boundaries. Yeah, like you, you mentioned that um, a theology is oftentimes viewed from a Christian perspective onto other traditions. Um, would you say comparative theology is then something that can be embraced by people from all kinds of backgrounds? Um, or is it more like something that Christians would use to look at other traditions? And also, would you say this could be the beginning of a, like a universal science of, um, I don't know, different, the different kind of faith groups, combining them into one kind of um, science? Well, I think, um, I mean, there are a number of levels to the question you're asking, uh, which is very interesting. I mean, starting with the idea of terminology. So certain words have a life of their own word theology with its roots in the Latin tradition, the Greek tradition, is a word of the, you know, of the West, the Greek West, the Latin West, the English speaking West. Um, and therefore, it's not a natural term. You, you, don't, you do have words you can find in Arabic or Chinese. Uh, you can search around and say, well, what's the word in Sanskrit for theology? And some people say like darshana, maybe. Uh, kind of as not simply as seeing, but as this kind of way of learning. But it's a struggle. And I, I think there's a trick of using the English language as the one language that so many people in the world share today without it becoming a straitjacket saying, if you use these words in English, you have to use them the way Christians use them. No, the, the words are free. They can be used differently. Even when I talk to Buddhist friends about faith seeking understanding and Buddhist theology, some will immediately raise their hand and say, no, wait a minute, B Buddhists don't have a sense of a supreme deity, so how can there be Buddhist theology? But there's certainly Buddhists who have faith, 
Buddhists who are seeking understanding and therefore back and forth. But Mike, you know, it goes on from there, I think my view um, and what I'm interested in is therefore finding like-minded men and women in other religious traditions other than my own, who are religious intellectuals, who are open to learning, who know their own tradition, but are willing to study another tradition and have these kind of global conversations across religious boundaries among believers in different traditions, learning from one another. I think this opens the door to a, you know, it's part of interreligious dialogue is the general category, but this is sort of a more informed, persistent, sustained form of that. I think for some people it might lead to, you know, the emerging of one universal understanding. My view is certainly in my lifetime, uh, you know, more a sense of um, increasing number of interconnections and resonances, points of contact, where in and after a long time, you're still going to have Theravada Buddhists and Roman Catholics and Shia Muslims and Orthodox Jews and so on. We're not in our lifetimes, I think any of us, I can safely say, be reaching the point of one religion or one final faith. But in terms of the science of religion, learning religiously, to have it as the habitual form of learning, to be learning across religious boundaries and no longer say, I'm a believer, therefore I only study my own tradition. Because I'm a believer, I can learn from all traditions where belief is important. Very nice. Let's segue into the, um, into the Yogananda's writings then on, um, on Christ. And in particular, let's say, uh, let's talk about the second coming of Christ, I say. But before we delve into that, um, Professor Clooney, perhaps you can tell us uh, the second coming of Christ. You know, I think we under we all understand that yeah. as the concept of, you know, Christ with, within you, not just Christ, you know, the resurrection of Christ or Christ reappearing on, on in blood and form again, but actually the Christ consciousness coming out of each one of us, you know, the second coming. Um, is that 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 theory or that concept? Is that have you had you ever heard of that before? Yogananda's particular spin on that. Well, usually when, when Christians talk about the second coming of Christ, they mean at the end of the world. And so it's even in the creed of the Christian churches, he will come again. And the, the scene you see in Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, of the last judgment, Christ sitting on the throne and the sheep and the goats and the judgment. People have that in mind. The second coming will be this in the end time as the world ends, Christ will come again. The clouds will open and Christ will come. But even short of that, which is kind of a scenario that you can imagine theatrically, uh, short of that, the sense that um, in the gospels, you have Jesus saying, I will be with you, I will come again. Um, and the early church, um, it seems even St. Paul in his letters talks about, you know, he's coming soon. And he didn't mean just metaphorically, he seemed to mean perhaps in our lifetime, namely the first century, he'll come back and had no idea that it was gonna take thousands of years for the church to develop. But I think some, when most Christians, you know, they have that general sense, second coming is at the end of the world. But there's also, uh, and I think this may be relevant to Yogananda's understanding, what Jesus says in John's gospel at the last supper, like in chapters 14, 15, 16, I will send you an advocate, I'll send you the um, Holy Spirit, and I will be with you in this new form. And that the going of Christ, the, uh, the death on the cross, the resurrection, the ascending into heaven is immediately to be followed with the new spiritual presence of Christ in the community, in the spirit. And that sense that God is fully in the community, is in individuals, is in the community that gathers to pray, isn't in Christian tradition usually talked about the second coming of Christ, but it, it has that element that Christ is not far away or 2000 years in the past or 2000 years in the future, but is with us in various ways as really as he was with the early church. And I think perhaps this is what Yogananda is rightly tapping into that to say, I believe in a savior figure who only lived a long time ago or will only live a long time in the future, but isn't here would be very dry and very um, disappointing. So I think he's picking up on if Christ is real, then Christ has to be here now. And we find Christ in the lives we live. Superb. Here you go, Mike. 
So when you when you first picked up the Second Coming of Christ at Lake Shrine back then and you read it, what did you make of um, the inclusion of the the Gospel of the Infancy of Jesus Christ that Yogananda writes about and I think it's attributed to the Apostle Thomas. Yeah, I mean, there, there are, um, I, I've used it in class actually, occasionally when I'm doing, a, I, a, one of my standard courses is called Krishna in Christ. And I'll use the infancy gospel of Thomas because you have in the Bhagavata Purana, you have all the stories of the childhood of Krishna and all that. And the gospels are not very rich about the childhood of Jesus or anything. Whether it's by Thomas or attributed to Thomas, uh, many scholars believe, you know, a century or two later, uh, early traditions that are gathered in the infancy gospel. I think, um, you know, that you have always several views when you're asking, well, what do Christians believe on these things? One would be, you know, the Orthodox teachers, the bishops, uh, the, the guardians of the faith, you might say, who would have often very little tolerance for things that are not in the Bible. Uh, they might not be against them, but they just say, well, that's not really relevant to our faith. Most pious believers, you know, church-going Christians, church-going Catholics, we probably know nothing about the infancy gospel of Thomas. Um, when I've talked to people about it, their eyes open, and I have to give them a link to look it up because they don't know anything about this. But once you look at it, and I, I used it in class this past semester, uh, the infancy gospel, you can see that the author or authors who put this together are, are imagining the space between the birth of Jesus and when he's 12 years old and is in the temple and Mary and Joseph seek him and they find him there because it ends with the end of chapter Luke chapter two. But all the things about what would it be like if God was a child on earth and his exotic powers making clay into birds and clapping his hands and they fly away. Um, but also as a small, you know, as a two year old uh, child, uh, you know, withering his, the other kids who bother him or destroying something, eventually all putting it back. So I, I think in, in scholarly circles and in more intellectual circles, as a good imaginative prayerful process of seeing Jesus as a boy, just as some people will say, well, what happened after age 12 up to age 30? And all the stories about Jesus going to India and something like that. Uh, for which there's no historical evidence, I don't think. But it's not harmful if people realize that they're using their contemplative powers to imagine the life of Jesus even beyond what's written down in the Bible. But once you read the infancy gospel of Thomas and see those stories and you realize that when Luke says at the end of chapter two of, of the gospel, he grew up in wisdom and age and matured, that if Jesus is truly human, then he wasn't a, an adult when he was two years old or five years old, but he had to grow up and become the Jesus we're familiar with. And so those stories, I think, really help. Right. If we can delve a bit deeper in, um, in the second coming, then, if we may. Um, so, for example, this is, you know, the Bible's spun in terms of its uh, interpretation to a much more Eastern you know, Eastern approach to, to what, uh, you know, what, what's written about Christ and the Gospels. Um, so, for example, I think in the introduction, Yogananda says, you know, don't consider, you need to consider Christ from the position in which he was born. So he was born in Palestine at the time, well, uh, you know, and he was an ori orient Orientalist. He wasn't an Occidentalist. So the influence of the culture at that time was, you know, there was a lot of, you know, ideas and language and stuff that that was that used to come across from the East and, and that area, that region of um, where, where, where Christ was born and had his had his life. So let's talk about some of the interpretations. So, you know, the yogic interpretations. Um, I'll, I'll allow you to, um, uh, Professor Clooney, to come in uh, before I talk about specifics. Um, how, how do you personally take the yogic interpretations versus, you know, uh, the, 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 Christ, the traditional Christian interpretations of, of some of the things that, that Christ has said? I mean, I think um, I've found, um, you know, from the first time I picked up the second coming of Christ, and I, I think there are a few parallels one might look at, like in the, in the Ramakrishna tradition. Uh, there's a beautiful little book called, um, you know, The Sermon on the Mount According to Vedanta. 
and some other you know little books about Christ according to Ramakrishna's teachings and so on. One doesn't go to these books expecting to simply learn what one already knows. And I, I think that has to be the spirit of it. That um, again, as I said before, there's kind of the official stance of the Catholic Church or the um, Lutheran Church or the Baptist Church, whatever, on, of the Orthodox churches of the East on what exactly is to be believed as a Christian. But most people are much more fluid. People are experiential. People have more or less education in their faith and be thinking all different kinds of things about Christ. Um, but if one is a, a Catholic, then one has to have some comfort in the Catholic community or Lutheran in the Lutheran community and so on like that. But I think, again, it takes a certain kind of openness of mind and lack of fear to say, well, here's somebody talking about this in a different way. And here's somebody who's reading very impressively. I mean, going through the gospels, reading them carefully, not skipping passages, but going through them, even quoting the passages in the published volume. And doing this the same way shows that for Yogananda, this was extremely important. It wasn't simply, I'll just say a, a little bit of lip service, I'll just say a few things about Christ and then move on. But what thousands of pages, you know, when this gets published as a book is extremely impressive. One other thing I'd add, and then you might work out for more specifics, but there's also the, the role of the scripture scholars, the Bible scholars. And this is a um, you know, in highly important intellectual tradition of historical criticism, form criticism, contextual criticism, of trying to read the Bible according to the time and place in which it was written. And one can do this you know, in terms of Shastra and some of the Vedanta traditions, reading the Upanishads, the Gita, and so on, or putting the Quran back in its historical context. These scholars are often uh, talking to one another, not to everybody, because most people don't think in the very technical historical terms. So I think if a scripture scholar, let's say a New Testament scholar, were to pick up Yogananda's interpretation of the Gospels, they wouldn't be expecting, I hope, that this would be the latest form critical study or the latest German scholarship on the Gita, even though you know, Yogananda has read carefully, he's thinking about what he's reading, you're not gonna get the scholar's approach. And I, I think also, um, you know, we, we work and function in traditions and one, as I said, does not go to Yogananda in order to hear what Roman Catholics think about the New Testament. And, and just as when I, I interpret the Bhagavad Gita, or I read one of the Upanishads, one isn't coming to me to hear, you know, Shankaracharya's reading of the Upanishad or Ramanuja's understanding of the Gita. No, it's, it's an outsider looking in who's thinking about this seriously. And I think, therefore, if, if one takes it up seriously, you say, well, this is different, this is different, this is different, this is different. I'm so glad that he's doing this because I have so much to learn from the way he brings it to life. Yeah, it's uh, something that uh, was interesting that you picked up on. Um, so we we're talking about the the Bible originally. I think it was in Arama Aramaic. Is that right? And um, and then translated into Hebrew, and then and then English, and then obviously all the other la languages, and then this is old English as well. So there's a lot of scope in my mind for through the ages an interpretation to evolve. What, what would you say, Professor? Yeah, Kuhnita? I mean. So as far as we know, the New Testament, which we have, the oldest form of it is in Greek, no. you know, the cosmopolitan language. But people don't believe, scholars don't believe that Jesus went around speaking Greek all the time, but rather he was probably speaking, as you say, Aramaic. And it's very odd and unusual that um, different from most religions, the Christian tradition doesn't try to have the original words of Jesus in the original language. A couple of words appear here and there, but basically it's already in translation. And then uh, the versions in, in you know, the Greek, the Koine Greek, the Greek of the ancient world, and then Latin, and then proliferation of uh, translations into Armenian and Syriac, um, and then into um, French and German, the King James Bible in English, which I believe Yogananda uses that translation. It's an ongoing process of translation. And same when you know, missionaries came to India and the East, figuring out how to translate it into the local language is not a scientific process where you have word for word meaning, you know, this turns into that, 
and it's all 100% clear, but it's an interp interpretive process where it has to be you know, poetically, imaginatively understood in a new context. So there's gonna be lots of interpretations and lots of changes. That's why even Christians, you know, um, in the early church, but also at the time of the Reformation when Catholics and Protestants split, serious disagreements about what the gospels meant or what St. Paul meant. And it wasn't so much that the, you know, they had different Bibles, they had the same letters of St. Paul, the same four gospels, but they, out of their own backgrounds with personal and communal and political interests, interpreted them differently. And if that's the case, a German Catholic and a German Protestant arguing about the meaning of the gospel, you wouldn't expect somebody from outside the Christian tradition in India or China or Africa to suddenly think like a German, but it would be received and understood just as with art. I think today we're realizing that for a long time in the West, it looked like Jesus was um, Irish. I grew up with an Irish Jesus in New York City, you know, blue eyes and uh, could have been one of my cousins maybe. Um, but no, I mean, Jesus was, was um, you know, Hebrew, he was, you know, of the Middle East, uh, you know, the, is, is the people today, Jews and Palestinians, that they, they are what Jesus looked like, so, you know, somewhere in there, and that if you are an African, you're going to see Jesus in terms of African experience, African face, and so too in Asia and so on, that we, if we get too stuck and say, the way I am familiar with is the only way to understand this, then it gets lost. And people can pull back and say, you read your scriptures, we'll read our scriptures, and we'll put up a wall between us is a really bad idea, even though it keeps things like neat and clean. And so Yogananda, you know, without any, um, apparently without any hesitation, uh, just a full reading of the gospels according to his background, his teacher, uh, his understanding of yoga, cosmic vibrations, spiritual realities, and so on, um, is, is, a, is another translation process. It's fair for people inside a tradition to say, thank you very much, but I think you don't have it right. I think you don't understand that. Just as if I you know, interpret um, the Chandogya Upanishad, it's fair for a pundit in India to say, you don't understand that because you've missed such and such. I think it's fair for a Christian to say to somebody, you don't understand that gospel passage the way we do. But that doesn't mean you should be silenced or you shouldn't do this, but rather the dialogue is now let's talk about this because we're finally reading the same book. And that's a beautiful thing. Yes, let's, um, if we uh, may, I know Chris, you want to say stuff, but I really want to get into yes. some, some specifics. Do we go on Chris? You, you got so much to say. There's so many, I mean, I'll not take it too much. I'll not take it so much. just like a comment, actually, it's funny, funny listening um, to you about the, um, let's say the perception of Jesus uh, from different cultures and uh, Yogananda, I believe, uh, reported that he had uh, had, a, had a vision or, or met with Jesus uh, at least twice, maybe maybe more. And uh, he came to him once with brown eyes and I think the second time with blue, right? And uh, he was saying that essentially Jesus could manifest himself any which way he mm. he kind of pleased. But um, I, thought, I find that quite, quite funny. But um, maybe maybe this isn't taking it too far off topic, but I'm, I'm curious, uh, Professor Clooney, Clooney, what your interpretation is of uh, Matthew 3.16 when the, uh, John is baptizing Jesus and uh, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove uh, in relation to what Yogananda and the SRF would say um, when you would meditate and, and look towards the, the seat of consciousness and uh, the third eye and, and witness, let's say, the, the uh, bright white light of um, uh, well, it's a symbol, actually, uh, that, that we would have the, the star uh, and, and see that uh, like a white light descending from you there. Do, do you see those two things as, as the same or how would the church or yourself interpret them? Well, I think, I mean, on one level, I'd say I'd have to, you know, we'd have to take a half hour break and I'd have to go look up the text <laughs> and study it and get back to you. But uh, without doing that, and I, I read it, but not, not recently. I, I think in some ways, what Yogananda is pointing to is the spiritual experience of Jesus himself. And so there's a temptation in, in some Christian circles, I think, to say Jesus, like God, descended to earth 
and he simply is God on earth and he goes around teaching and healing and helping people and then he dies on the cross and reascends. But if he's human, there are moments that are key in his life where he begins to have a wider understanding of who he is. And that doesn't take away from divinity or perfection or anything, but it means he's really human. And that, uh, you know, the baptism at the Jordan in all the gospels comes across as a scene where, where something happens to Jesus that awakens his reality so that he can begin his mission. So he comes to the river, he's intrigued by John, the Baptist who's come in out of the desert. Everybody is, you know, throcking, you know flocking out there to see John. And when Jesus comes, it, it looks in some ways as if he's simply going to get baptized by John. You know, he's one of the crowd. But then when that happens, as you say, the light descends and the, the voice from heaven comes, my beloved son. Um, the hovering of the spirit as a, a dove over his head. Some people say that simply means that it's kind of this gentle movement down. It wasn't a harsh wind or a, a loud noise or anything. But like a dove hovers, so too the spirit hovers, without literally meaning that the Holy Spirit came looking like a bird. It doesn't have to be that. But I, I think um, essential to understanding that passage would be in going to the holy man, John, who had come in from the desert, Jesus was awakened to a new level of spiritual understanding about who he was himself. And as it, you know, that's then he then is able to go out and begin, he goes into the desert, he confronts the evils of the world, suffering, uh, he's tempted by the devil, and then he comes out and saying the kingdom of God is here, uh, the kingdom of God has come. And I, I think it's quite fair to say, you know, the imagery of the light, the voice, the river, the purification, the desert, isn't 100% owned by the Christian church. And when people have other monastic and religious traditions thinking about spirit, light, voices from heaven, consciousness expanding, to bring all of that to bear and say, this is what the story of Jesus with John the Baptist reminds me of, is a way of, of bringing the whole thing to life. And if we, again, if we sterilize it and say only what we in the modern West think about Jesus is interesting, then we're losing, you know, the other 90% of the human race in terms of other ways of imagining what these stories are. And, and that's the classic text. I mean, just as people constantly go back and read uh, the Quran or read the Bhagavad Gita, going and reading the gospels from inside and outside the traditions in order to see what is really going on there is a good process. And, and Yogananda is doing it again and again, bringing it to life. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, related to that um, passage, um, let's talk about a couple of other ones. Um, so Chris beat me to it. Um, the, the other ones which read, when I read, without much, um, you know, traditional Christian schooling, um, is very obvious to me as, a, as an Indian. But um, you, can, uh, you can give me your take, uh, Professor Clooney, if, if he says things like, um, be still and know that I am God. For, for an Indian, a uh, Hindu and a Buddhist background, that's a pretty uh, simple interpretation, isn't it, for us? Mm -hmm. But for, for Christians, if I, if I offered that, or traditional, conventional Christians, if I offered that same yogic interpretation, be still, you know, still your mind, focus your attention, they, they would be like, what are you talking about? The, you know, Christ didn't preach this, this isn't in the Bible. And, and I've had that conversation many times. Uh, Francis, what would you what would you say to that uh, discussion, that dialogue that I've had on multiple occasions? Well, I think the, the first thing is that um, it's your interpretation and you bring something to the table that is worth hearing. And, and, and if people haven't thought of this before, it doesn't mean they shouldn't think of it in the future. So you bring it forth. Also, you're quoting from the Old Testament. Um, you know, be still and know that I am God. That's from the Psalms, I believe. Uh, a sense of these powerful passages of theophany encounter with God, but all the way back to the book of Genesis and Exodus, uh, uh, Elijah the prophet, you know, God passes him by and is present only in a still small voice and having nothing to say in the presence of God. All of that's in place already because Jesus is a Jew. And he didn't say, well, forget the Judaism, now I'm a Christian. No, he's not a Christian. He is a Jew even to his death. All this powerful kind of contemplative tradition even though the Jewish, you know, in the Bible, 
there's no Jewish uh, monastic tradition. There are prophets, there are people who live in the desert and so on. But a sense that there's a wider spiritual reality that is not simply about being moral or offering sacrifices and so on, but the sense of you know, stripping everything away to have encounter with God. And I think when we in the modern West, you know, for good reasons, many people are concerned with the ethical meaning of the gospels and, and how does reading the gospel, how does religion help us to be better citizens or to help our neighbor can make it so ethical that the mystical and the spiritual elements disappear. And it becomes like, um, you know, good works, works of charity, work, 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 build institutions. And, and what some of these other mystical passages such as you point to, or the other ones in Genesis and so on point to, are these overwhelming encounters with God. And then you realize these pop up in the gospels too, where suddenly somebody realizes this isn't just a healer or a brilliant preacher, but I'm sort of in the presence of God and they fall down and worship him. Or, um, you know, Jesus walks out on the water and they're frightened to death. And then Peter walks out on the water and Jesus saves him from drowning. There are theophanies, um, you know, these moments where suddenly the divinity is revealed. Most famously, um, in all four Gospels, well, certainly the three, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, maybe less clear in John, uh, what's called the transfiguration. So up on the mountain, uh, Jesus is with his disciples, uh, several disciples, and then um, the light shines out of him, this brilliant, brilliant light that is so bright that nobody can look at it. It's the brightest, it's like a thousand suns burning in their eyes. It's all there shining. And the voice again comes from heaven. Um, listen to this person. This is my beloved son. And for a moment, the disciples are realizing, we just thought this was Jesus. And we've been walking with him and talking to him and hearing him speak and eating with him at table and so on. And suddenly this overwhelming light is revealed. And I think what somebody like Yogananda would be reminding us, you know, from yogic traditions, is that the light is always shining. It's just that we don't have our eyes open to see it. And therefore, these, these in-breaking moments enhanced by a yogic perception or the spiritual sensitivities of, of Hinduism, could be Buddhism also, I suppose, but yoga, um, are enabling us to experience the spiritual reality of Christ deeper than the surface meanings of some of the gospel passages. But um, how would I convince the brother disciple who may be from a different church to close his eyes, not in contemplation of, you know, one of the pastimes of, from Christ's life, um, but actually just to sit in the stillness yeah. and actually apply a scientific technique of going inward as, as Yogananda has taught. And I'm sure you're aware of all the other um, spiritual paths that I teach. I mean, there, you know, there, there are so many different, today, so many different ways that people are using the Bible and interpreting it. And some are very ritualistic and some are very ethical and moral about good works. But there are people who, as you were saying, I mean, go looking for this guidance on the spiritual life and realizing that, you know, there are these passages, be still and know that I am God. God is present in the small voice. Uh, God is in the burning bush all these powerful scenes, and that we don't really have in the Bible or in most Western Christian consciousness, the spiritual practices to go with that. <clears throat> there is in the Greek church and the Latin church, you know, the mystical traditions of the fathers of the church, the mothers of the church who lived in the desert, uh, great saints like St. Benedict, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Ignatius and others who have spiritual paths. But for many people, um, the sense that well, we could learn to be quieter. We could learn to sit in God's presence by practicing yoga. To me, is a really good idea. There are some Christians who are very vociferous against that, uh, saying, well, if you practice yoga too much, you'll become a yogi and cease to be a Christian. And I don't dismiss that possibility that you know, yoga can be a complete way of life. And if one practices it assiduously and has a good master, a good teacher who guides one on the path, it could be that's enough, period. Um, but I think for most people, and most people, you know, even in India who practice yoga, it's related to some other, it's enriching a tradition rather than being an alternative tradition. And I think for a Christian um, to practice yoga, there's a whole website, Christian Yoga, 
or <laughs> Christians practicing yoga, look it up. A uh, whole website where saying that you know, we needn't be afraid of this, just as Zen practice can be exceedingly helpful for learning how to be quiet in God's presence. And I think what Yogananda is doing again and again in the, you know, the second coming of Christ is out of his meditative and contemplative experience, uh, showing that when he has his yogic eyes opened and is aware of the light, then suddenly all these other mysteries and elements of light and mystical power come out of the gospels. Whereas some Christian readers, you know, often for good reasons, but nonetheless may be missing that by simply saying there are rules in the Bible, do this, don't do that, or love your neighbor, social action, which is exceedingly important. But also this mystical element, we may need you know, a real mystic from any tradition to help us to be aware that that's what's in the, in the gospels. And Yogananda wasn't say stop reading the Bible and instead, um, you know, read, um, read my autobiography, <laughs> rather saying, I will read with you the Bible. So in his magazine, you know, doing this week after week, year after year, was a way of saying, I'm not replacing the Bible, I'm not doing away with it, but I'm opening it up from my perspective and for my disciples and for many a Christian, I think, or there should be more Christians, to learn from Yogananda how better to read the Bible. Um, would you say, um, Francis, that this um, perspective that Yogananda brought, um, first of all, do you find this is a unique perspective on the Bible that he brought? And also, the, um, could you describe the impact it made in the community of, let's say, theology? Like, is this a, a book that is quoted a lot these days or is, is the yeah. impact not so large at the moment? I mean, I think in terms of the history, um, he is, is one of the, as far as I'm aware, and I could be corrected on this, one of the only uh, Hindus to so conscientiously go through the Gospels. Um, in the 19th century, Dayananda Saraswati, uh, I think founder of the Arya Samaj, he went through the Bible somewhat polemically, pointing out you know, all kinds of things that are improbable if you're not a believer why are you attacking our Hindu Puranas and so on like that if you have stories like this in the Bible? So he read parts of the Bible, but not in the same spirit. It was a different apologetic spirit. Uh, Ramakrishna, as you know, had devotion to Jesus, had encounters, an encounter with Jesus where they merged into each other. Um, and his disciples, you know, the order, I think, of monks was founded on uh, Christmas Eve. And they every year on Christmas Eve, they celebrate Christmas and the Ramakrishna tradition. And there are little books, as I mentioned, Sermon on the Mount according to Vedanta, um, comparisons of Jesus and Ramakrishna and so on. But I think again, uh, the, the special category that uh, Yogananda is in is doing what I admire greatly, not just picking out the verses that you like, you know, the, spirit, the kingdom of God is within you or I and the Father are one, but going through passage after passage, chapter after chapter, gospel after gospel, because if we only pick the parts we like, it's too easy. Mm -hmm. If I only go to the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishad, because I like certain passages and never read the rest of it, then I'm failing to learn from it fully. And I think Yogananda is saying, we're going to do this seriously and learn. You know, I, I'm not a historian of Yogananda tradition. I know, you know, a lot I know is from the, the film, Awake, about the, the great impact he had in Southern California, the crowds of people that came to his teachings and so on like that. And he's been, a, you know, the last hundred years, a continuing presence in American culture, one of the pioneers of Hinduism in the West, of yoga in the West. Um, probably not as famous for most people as Vivekananda, let's say, um, but nonetheless, is always mentioned in this kind of primary group. I would say today, um, it's a rare thing to find Christians who have actually uh, studied the second coming of Christ. Um, I think, you know, I'll use passages in my courses sometimes. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Yogananda's interpretation, but for most Catholics and most priests and most bishops and so on, they don't know anything about it, um, which is, you know, but, but these are mostly the same people who have never read the Quran. They've never read the, Dharma, the Dhammapada, you know, the great Buddhist text. Uh, they've never read uh, rabbinic Jewish texts. Uh, they don't know much about uh, Native American traditions or 
oral African traditions. So if people you know, have, don't have the time and they don't have the interest or capacity to learn. Um, but Yogananda is one of the ones who it seems if you're gonna have a, a you know, waiting list of things you should be reading, that the second coming of Christ does really help Christians to think differently about their sacred book uh, and how to read the gospels. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, this coming Sunday, always in August every year in, in Catholic churches at least, we read through chapter six of the gospel according to John. And it begins with the multiplication of loaves and fishes, the feeding of the 5,000. But then Jesus goes on to talk symbolically about the bread of life, uh, eating my flesh, drinking my blood, the whole mystery of who Jesus is and what his nourishment energy is for the world. <clears throat> knowing that I'd be talking to you today and also preaching on this on Sunday, chapter six of John, I've been looking into Yogananda on chapter six of John. And he has this fascinating interpretation of, of what it really meant to say that Jesus multiplied loaves and fishes for the sake of, of the 5,000 in terms of you know, energy and matter, the master of all things, being able to make things available to people according to their need. He's, he's trying not to simply say miracle, everybody cheer, or scientifically say, no, it couldn't have happened, but say, if you realize that the boundary between the spiritual and the material is a permeable boundary, and that um, things as they are are also energies, then you can begin to imagine the spiritual event of the feeding of the 5,000 was actually something that a spiritual master could do by breaking open matter and making it available to people. Now, I'm not saying that that's, again, a standard Christian interpretation, but it's making me think about, in the month of August, how to preach about um, uh, chapter six of John and the, the sign that Jesus gives of feeding the crowds, that maybe we take it too literally or deny it too literally, but we don't understand Jesus as a spiritual being and therefore can't really engage it. So we have to change and be opened up in order to even appreciate a gospel passage. Okay. And I wish more, more Christians would do this, but I, I, I'm, I don't think, I'm not sure how many do this on a regular basis, read Yogananda. Related to that, Mike's question, um, Yogananda's, a lot of Yogananda's early work, and probably still is, is to um, really reform that churchianity and what i mean that by that is people just you know and this this is true for all faiths isn't it people just go to ch church or go to a mosque or go to the temple and listen to the sermon and go oh that's nice and go home and nothing really changes you know there in, in our temple for example there may be there may be a talk on um, the the importance of fasting and real restraint on you know your diet and no, never over consume food and you know all that all that you know really simple stuff but then they weren't really they was just in one ear out the other and a lot of Yogananda's work was to really make you know shake people into really following following the practices and really preaching what the practices meant and he used the term you know I, I don't want to bring about a new christianity i want you to relearn the original christianity um what, what, what would you what would you say to that well i think um you know as you're saying um you know churchianity or the the reduction of a religion to certain habits and ways of doing things and institutions and formulas and so on is a human thing. We, we do that all the time. And what you need, you know, artists and musicians and poets and uh, even brilliant scientists who break open the paradigms. In religion too, you need people in every age who not necessarily come with a new revelation, but are able to put people back in touch with the spirituality that they have, but they've covered it over, layered it, locked it in a box, uh, taken it for granted. And that, um, you know, in, in the Christian tradition, saints like Francis of Assisi um, or someone more recent like Mother Teresa in India, uh, figures who are, are not saying anything that different from what's in the Gospels, but suddenly everybody's shocked to say, here's somebody taking it seriously and, and believing that it can change the world. And I think, um, I would like to think that, you know, when people like me look at Hindu texts, we can bring out something that many Hindus wouldn't even notice 
because there's certain ways that gurus and acharyas teach it and that's it, period. But suddenly somebody comes from the West and says, can't you see what this is doing and how it resonates with spiritual values found in the Bible, Song of Songs or something, all of that. And likewise to say, um, Yogananda realized both, you know, maybe in his own tradition, but meeting Christians in Southern California, that a lot of it was about institutions and membership and uh, contributing to the church and singing hymns, but people didn't come to him, you know, because he was, um, you know, forcing them to come or, or paying them to come, but they were looking for spirituality they weren't finding from the minister at their church or the pastor of their church. And the idea that somebody can bring it to life. I mean, many, many people have said a you know, different obvious example, uh, Mahatma Gandhi um, has helped many people to understand better what it means to be a Christian by the way he took seriously the nonviolence of Jesus. Um, and the ability to say, don't you realize we, we can't just say, turn the other cheek and then build bombs and drop them on people or run, you know, overtake the world and run it like a colony but rather if you take the words of Jesus truly, and he had learned from Leo Tolstoy, John Ruskin, figures in the West, then you begin to realize that this opens up a whole new level of being a believer in the 21st century or 20th century. And then uh, for Yogananda likewise, helping Christians to see that the Bible is a spiritual text, which could mean that fewer Christians would become Hindu or Buddhist because if they realize that the spirituality in the Bible learning that even from Yogananda, then they could say, oh, thank you, you've given me back my own tradition. And I think that can be a beautiful thing. If I help somebody to read the Bhagavad Gita and realize that everything they're looking for is actually there, I'm not gonna say, oh, I should have done it poorly so they would have become Christian, but rather opening up the spiritual treasures of a tradition for people is a good thing that at least we should be trying to do if we're teachers or pastors helping people spiritually and and yogananda i think you know is is important because of his yoga tradition and his own experiences of his teacher and so on but this very distinctive feature you know represented by the second coming of christ is that interreligiously he was a great pioneer and that he didn't become less a hindu you might say simply because he was reading the bible but in some sense showed the universality of hindu tradition yoga tradition by not being afraid to read the Bible. And I think that's so important. Yes. Um, one final, um, I, I, would, I would like your um, academic uh, prowess on this. The Yogananda talks often about Jesus the man versus Jesus the Christ and the Christ consciousness. Um, I, I, again, I've tried to explain this concept about to, to my friends and they find it really difficult to comprehend that, you know, that divinity aspect of Jesus being just a man or Christ consciousness coming to him. What, what, how would you, um, how would you help me in, interpret that? Well, I mean, first of all, historically to realize it took the, the early Christian churches hundreds of years after the Bible to figure out how to say properly that Jesus is truly God and truly human. Because there are all kinds of groups that maybe unfairly we call heresies now uh, that said he's just a human being or he's just God who kind of floated down to earth. They were trying to make sense. But the, the standard, you know, the, the, the creed and the doctrine of the church was that he is truly human and truly divine. But that only sets up the problem that you can't know who Jesus is if you see him merely as a first century Jew. And you also can understand him properly if you see him as this mystic Christ who's permeating the universe and had something long ago to do with Israel, but that was in the past. And, and the trick is to be able to imagine Jesus as this huge, very distinctive figure in whom the divine and the human are inseparable. And that to know his humanity is the window to seeing his divinity the more you see his divinity, you, you realize that it is God on earth, God among the people, God who dies on the cross, that both the, the divinity points you to the humanity, the humanity points you to the divinity. And to see all of this as interconnected um, rather than um, you know, take your pick. And I think that uh, pertains finally to what you're saying about Jesus Christ. And there's a way in which 
there can be a too narrow interpretation of Jesus, um, only Jesus, Jesus of history, Jesus of Nazareth, everything else pales by comparison. And for a believer in a certain way, that's true. But Jesus is also the Christ, this universal figure, uh, the one who is to come, the anointed one, the one chosen by God, who has this universal meaning. But if you have simply the, you know, Christness or the Christ um, uh, mystery and forget about the Jesus of Nazareth, that he was a Jew of the first century who died on a cross, then the Christ thing would become very vague and basically what anyone wants it to be. And so Jesus as Christ, Christ as Jesus, holding that together. And I think that's not against what Yogananda is doing. I mean, he's bringing out much more of the Christ element than the universal element, as the Ramakrishna Swamis tend to do. But to go back and say, but he's still a first century Jew. And he came and walked on the earth in a certain time, as certain more historically conscious understandings of Krishna, let's say, would be or Rama, that there are these figures with universal meaning, but they also came as avatars in a certain time period and then weren't there anymore. They came and they left. And somehow Jesus of Nazareth and then living on in the community by the spirit is a reality that still has to be connected back, even if it's larger than the original setting. Thank you. Um, oh, go ahead. Had, oh, sorry. Um, I, we had um, Baron Sony on uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and he's um, uh, at USC, and he told us about the situation there um, with students that there is basically a bit of a they have difficulties with mental health and with um, uh, loneliness and that this is like an epidemic among young people and he felt like that as the dean of religious life at USC he he felt like um, someone who can at least try to mitigate this do you feel like this is part of your work at Harvard as well in some form well I'd like to think that all of us you know particularly of a certain age when you are established and older and have a teaching position you, you teach the whole person. You don't teach, all you are is the third person in the fourth row and you're here to do the reading, to write things and get a grade and then by see you again sometime. But it's a human contact and that's why we don't just do everything online except during this past year, but rather to have this human contact, particularly in religion, because religion is not, you know, religion is spirituality. Religion is a way of life. Uh, the books are part of a way of life. And if you say, well, we're going to read this beautiful book and it's got spiritual meaning, and the fact that you're depressed or that you're um, unemployed or that you've had you know, deaths in your family or you're anorexic or suicidal, well, I'm sorry, that's, you know, go, go see somebody else about that. I can't help you. I'm not professionally, you know, I'm a Catholic priest for many years and have some skill in how to talk to people in trouble but I'm not a trained counselor, I'm not a licensed uh, therapist or anything like that. And at Harvard or any university, we'd be encouraged to send the student in trouble to an expert, you know, because you don't want to get over your head uh, when you're not aware of what's really going on. But in, in terms of most of the time, to be able to see that a student seem to be distracted in class or a student seem to be upset or a good student um, is suddenly not doing the work or is missing classes. So email them and say, well, you know, I missed you in class. Uh, anything I can help you with? And, and sometimes students say, no, thank you. Um, you're not the one I want to have help me. And other times they say, I'd love to talk to you. Can we talk about these things? And I think, you know, so therefore the, the idea of an academic as kind of an ivory tower figure who's an expert doesn't really fit the religion model. You know, we should be scholar practitioners. And as teachers, we should be also inspirers, healers, counselors, able to, you know, share life with our students in some appropriate way in terms of learning and also what these things mean in a difficult time like the time we're living in. Do you, Francis, do you ever use um, any universal kind of spiritual concepts that you can give to anyone that, that may be going through some difficult times? So, yeah, something that's universal that, 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 that might help someone. Well, I think um, we could probably come up with a list of a hundred bits of advice I give. But I think, uh, you know, back to where I, I said much earlier 
about you know your autobiography matters that if you're seeking god god is already active in your life you wouldn't be seeking god unless god was already there so some kind of pathway of not wishing you were a different person or wishing that everything you know was different but rather um, the peace I seek, the God I seek is already in some way latent within me. And that even if I'm in a really difficult time to realize that the spiritual possibilities are here, it doesn't justify the suffering, but nonetheless, it's real. I mean, Catholic tradition, Jesuit tradition, we you know, talk about finding God in all things. And that um, where you are is where you can find God because God is finding you. So I'd start with something like that. <laughs> Chris, did you have something to say? You yeah, yeah, I, it's on all on a similar vein to what the guys are asking. So um I, I did have a thought really when we find ourselves now in the information age, you know, with technology, we, we can access so much information. That really is taking people away from the traditional kind of community uh uh sex that they would find themselves in, you know, maybe a hundred years ago and, and more, so not, not that long. Um, and, and with COVID now, especially with uh, taking people away further from their communities, and that really would be in a religious uh, context in the church. Uh, and it would be the same for us in the SRF. We would go into the mother center or, you know, go to, go to the London center, wherever you might be. What, what impact is this having on the current status of religion and you know, for the young people of, of uh, you know, the generation, um, maybe 18 years or so, where is it going to go in the future? Yeah, uh, that's a very big question for another day, perhaps, but to, to, to briefly as we, as we conclude, I mean, I would say on the one hand, you know, probably there have always been people seeking and looking for something meaningful more than they had. But in our life, in my lifetime, so you know, the late, you know, the first second half of the 20th century and now the first part of the 21st century, the social kind of dissolution of structures, the enormous individual freedom has accelerated this process of people needing and being able to find things on their own. You know, there's no social pressure in many places to still stay in a church or stay in a temple, whatever, but people are doing what they want. On one level, this is you know, like it or not, this is absolutely necessary. Um, you can't tell people stop having questions, stop seeking, stop being dissatisfied with your church. No, it's going to happen. And, and I think religious leaders have to be aware that their congregations are drifting away, going in other directions, and not seeing that as against the will of God, but that in our time period, learning from other religious traditions, practicing yoga, doing Zen, uh, going for walks on the beach, all of these things can be extremely helpful spiritually. But in the long run, I think that as in American politics, we could be in deep trouble if uh, institutions collapse and you only have like a mass of people attacking each other on Twitter and everybody is their own religion and no sense of community, the incredible loneliness and so on. And I think therefore, communities around inspired teachers and ancient, ancient traditions need to keep kind of finding ways to welcome people in and draw people in. But it may not, you know, right now, people who are 20, 30 right now may say, well, based on their parents and grandparents and so on, they're not going to suddenly come rushing in the door. But traditions need to stay alive and need to update themselves in order that people can come back when they're ready. Because if everybody ends up having their own religion, it's like the Tower of Babel in the Bible. Everybody will talk to themselves and nobody will understand anyone else. And if I don't understand you, you're my enemy and therefore I'll attack you, which leads to kind of a social insanity. And I think religiously, we believe if there's one spiritual reality and, and I would say one God, that we're all children of God and we belong together and we have to keep finding ways to make that happen without being afraid of what is actually happening in terms of interreligious learning and so on. Professor Clooney, I think we'll have to end it there because oh. the, we've gone over the hour. Oh, but yeah. Thank you so much. It's been an absolutely beautifully uplifting talk. Oh, well. thank you very much. Wonderful questions. Wonderful to share this time with you. It's been very good. Thank you.
Professor Clooney, okay. I think you also know that we're quite a spiritually um, inclined group. So would you like to lead us through one of your favorite prayers, perhaps, and we can end it there? I'll, I'll just offer a prayer, okay. Sure. Um, loving God, we thank you for all your good gifts. We thank you for gathering us as friends and colleagues and spiritual pilgrims in many different traditions. Help us to know that you are always with us, guiding us in hard times as well as good times. Help us to trust your spirit within us that we may share the gift of spirit with all your people. Amen. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.